Welcome to the Holy Booklet of Rules. This is definitely not the place to start when it comes to writing formulas or naming compounds. But what this is, like a lot of good rule books, it's a place where you can come back to when you need to check because this is a very important chapter and there's different rules depending on the different types of compounds you have. And there's two main things that are happening here. You write compounds and you name compounds. So. I'm going to begin here. Uh, you could go through this just as a PowerPoint, but the truth of the matter is it's probably better if you actually hear a voice, my voice, describing some of these things. So in step A, we are looking at the steps for naming ionic compounds with two elements. They are basically called binary ionic, bi as in bicycle, two, two elements. So for example, um, we are given a formula, CAF, and then this little subscript, 2. Um, that subscript tells you that there are two atoms of fluorine, one atom of calcium, and a molecule of calcium fluoride. Um, so, if we are asked to name that compound, this is basically the process you go through. You name the metal ion, that's the first one, calcium, then you name the non-metal ion. Um, we said it was fluorine. The rule is that you change the ending on the second, the non-metal ion, to ide. So now it becomes fluoride. Put the two of them together. The name of CAF2 is calcium fluoride. Piece of cake. There is actually a practice sheet, 8.3 naming ionic compounds, that goes through this. Uh, as you can see, 8.3 is after 8.1 and after 8.2. So um, I personally suggest that you start with a lot of those little computer modules, formulas one, formulas two, formulas three, common chemicals, some of the Bobby talks on 8.2, uh, before you ever get to this 8.3. But as you can see, um, that's the process for naming ionic compounds. At some point or other on that worksheet, you should um, practice a few on the number 1 to 20 side of the page, check with me to make sure you're doing it right, and then turn in number 21 to 40 when you figure you have it perfected, and I will actually mark it. Okay, over the page, steps for writing formulas of ionic compounds with two elements. So in the first section, we were naming them. We were given a formula. In this case, we are given a name. And now we have to write the formula. So the name is zinc nitride. Tells you you've got two elements in that compound. Um, by the way, just in case you're confused by this, when you put elements together in a compound, the properties of those individual elements are altered. Um, take, for instance, common table salt, sodium chloride. Um, sodium is a metal, soft metal that explodes in water. Chlorine is a poisonous gas. Neither one of those would you dare put in your body. But as a compound, sodium chloride, no problem. Uh, different properties altogether. Okay, these are the steps for writing formulas. Uh, identify the ions that actually make these up. Because these are binary ionic compounds, they are a metal and a non-metal. There's an element from the left side of the periodic table and an element from the right side of the periodic table. So the first step is to identify that it is in fact zinc and nitrogen. So identify each ion and its charge. We have a zinc ion which is 2 plus. You can get this off your periodic table. You can get it off your sheet of polyatomic ions. Um, this is just the most common ion of zinc. Same thing with nitrogen. And again, don't be worried about the word nitride. There's no element called nitride. Um, it's because, of course, when you name a compound, you change the ending nitrogen to nitride. 
and again the most common ion of nitride is the negative 3 ion. So just in case you're bothered by those superscripts, 2 plus just means it's lost 2 electrons, 3 minus means it gains 3 electrons. So step 1, out of the way. Determine the total charges needed to balance positive and negative ions. Every compound you ever have has to add up to zero. This number plus this number. The charge on the metal ion plus the charge on the non-metal ion has to equal zero. So, um, to make them equal, uh, it's basically like finding the common denominator. If I have three zincs, two plus two plus two, I'm gonna add those up to plus six. And if I have two, nitrides minus 3 minus 3 equals minus 6. Notice that plus 6 and minus 6 add up to 0. Yeah, they cancel out. So note the ratio of positive to negative. There's three zinc 2 plus ions, 1, 2, 3, for every two nitrogen 3 minus ions. These are the two nitrogen 3 minus. So again, we are writing the formula and I can I almost imagine you know what it is already just by looking at that. You use subscripts to write the formula, and by the way, you never use a 1 as a subscript. We just assume that. So in this particular case, we said there was 3 zinc 2 plus ions, so we write the 3 as a subscript. That means a number to the right and lower down. Make sure it actually is noticeably lower down. Make sure it's actually smaller so that it's not confusing. So. Zn3N2 is the correct formula for the name zinc nitride. Good. So, uh, again, there's a practice sheet. Move on to 8.2 writing formulas for ionic compounds. We will do a few examples together. Then if you're not sure you have it mastered, try a few more from the number 1 to 20 side of the page. Um, make sure you check your answers with me before you actually turn in number 21 and 40 for marking. Uh, there is a more complicated situation here though if you have not just single elements but you have something called polyatomic ions or multivalent metal ions. So let's just take a look at those. First, section C, steps writing formulas of compounds with multivalent ions. See in this name iron 3 sulfide? The Roman numeral 3 is associated or connected to the metal. So this is a multivalent metal. If you look on your periodic table, you'll notice a lot of transmission, transition metals, iron for instance, uh, nickel, copper, uh, a whole bunch of them have more than one possible charge. So in the name, they have to tell you which one it is in this case. In this case, they're telling you it's iron three plus and sulfur, of course, you can just get off the periodic table. So, steps in writing the formula for a compound with a multivalent ion is to identify each ion. One of them is obviously iron 3 plus, that's what the Roman numeral tells you. And then the sulfur, and again the ending has been changed to I because there's just the two elements, is minus 2. So those are the two ions in this ionic compound. Determine the total charges needed to balance positive and negative ions. Again, they have to add up to zero. How can you make three and negative two add up to zero? Think about it. What happens if you have two iron three pluses and three sulfur two minuses plus six plus negative six equals zero? Again, every compound has to add up the charges to zero. So note the ratio of positive to negative, two iron three plus ions for three S two minus ions. Again, don't confuse these charges with subscripts. The charges are written as superscripts up higher, whereas the subscripts turn up in the formula. So you use subscripts to write the formula. We said there was two iron three plus. That's how you would write iron, two iron three plus. Two as a subscript, and then the same thing for sulfur, we said there was three. So Fe2S3 is the formula for iron three sulfide. Got it? By the way, don't hesitate to actually ask for help with some of this stuff. Um, as a matter of fact, not asking for help would be a huge mistake. There are a lot of lovely little videos on the website, Bobby Talks and other ones, 
um, that'll give you help with this. But the easiest way is, you know what, just ask me and I will help you, right? So you should probably move on to 8.2 writing formulas for anode compounds. And again, uh, we may or may not do a few examples in class. Then if you're not sure you have it mastered, try a few from the number one to 20 side of the page and check with me to make sure you're doing them right before you ever turn in number 21 to 40 for marking. So number 21 to 40 is where I actually assign a mark and we find out if you've mastered it. I think there's one last section, <gasps> two last sections. Um, section D is steps for naming ionic compounds containing a multivalent metal. So that's not very well worded there. Now, in this particular case, you are given a formula and you need to name it uh, but again you have to be careful because you have to check whether these are multivalent is the metal and again the metal is the first element in the compound is it just got one charge or is there more than one possibility the only way you know is by using your periodic table and from this point on in your life in chemistry you will always 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 have access to a periodic table, a table of polyatomic ions. You don't memorize this stuff, right? So let's look at the formula Cu3P. Uh, identify the metal. It's the first one. Always, always, always. Uh, copper. And verify that it can form more than one kind of ion by checking the periodic table. If you look at your periodic table, you're going to see that copper can be 2 plus or 1 plus. So it's multivalent. Determine the ratio of ions in the formula. Cu3P means that there's three copper ions for every phosphide ion. That's what the formula tells us. Three copper, one phosphorus. Note the charge of the negative ion from the periodic table. So the negative ion is the second element in the formula. Phosphorus charge on phosphide is P minus and again, they have to add up to zero. So the positive and negative charges must balance out. Determine what the charge needs to be on the metal ion to balance the negative ion. So each of the three copper ions must have a charge of one plus to balance the one phosphide ion with a charge of three minus. Therefore, the name of the copper ion is copper one. You might want to read that again. So. What we're after here is writing the name of the compound. You were given the formula. Now, finally, you can come up with the right answer and write the name. We said it's copper 1-phosphide. Right. So you go, go back. Phosphorus is minus 3. The only way that can add up to 0 is if each copper is 1. Copper 1-phosphate. So uh, another example would be MnO2. Again, what you're after here is to name this. Uh, a great idea would be for you to try this on your own. You might want to just stop the video for a second and see if you can come up with the correct name. Identify the metal, manganese. Periodic table, depending on which periodic table you have, uh, will identify this as multivalent. You could have a charge of 2+, plus, 3+, plus, or 4+. Plus. In other words, manganese has a tendency to either lose two electrons, three electrons, or four electrons. Um, the formula MnO2 means that you have one manganese ion for every two oxide ions. Right. So the charge on oxygen, if you look on your periodic table, is two minus. The one manganese ion must have a charge of four plus in order to balance the two oxide ions that each have a charge of minus two. Look at the formula. You have two oxides, ions. Each oxygen is minus two. Two times minus two is negative four. So manganese has to be Roman numeral four. And the correct name is manganese in brackets, Roman numeral, manganese four oxide. If you need that kind of fleshed out personally, you should come and talk to me. So finally, the last section, what do we do with polyatomic ions? This is where we have in a compound more than two elements. For example, we're given a name iron three hydroxide. There is no hydroxide on the periodic table. So immediately you know you are dealing with a polyatomic ion. You have a sheet of polyatomic ions. You don't need to memorize those. You just need to recognize that, aha, 
when I see things like hydroxide, grab that sheet and find out what hydroxide is. So, identify each ion. First one is obviously iron 3, which we write as a superscript, Fe3+. And hydroxide, if you look at that polyatomic ion sheet, you'll see it's OH-. Second step is to determine the total charges needed to balance positive with negative. And again, they have to add up to zero. The only way that can happen is if you have three hydroxide. See, the temptation here for a lot of people would be to put a little three by the OH. But you see, that three will only affect the hydrogen. And this is a polyatomic ion. They have to stick together. The only way you can do that is to use brackets one iron atom for every three hydroxide ions. Use subscripts and brackets to write the formula. Omit brackets if you only have one ion. Yeah, so we said it was three hydroxides. Make sure you put the hydroxide in brackets. Subscript three. You can check your answer because we said iron was three plus. Hydroxide is minus one. Three times minus one is negative three, which balances the positive iron Three. You should try ammonium carbonate. One million dollars and a purple Ferrari if you can come up with the correct formula for ammonium carbonate. Why don't you try it? Stop the video, give it a shot. It's important that you know that you can do this on your own, and you can. Um, sometimes it takes a little more time, but you can do it. So, ammonium carbonate, the first step is to identify each ion and its charge. Ammonium, there is no such element on the periodic table, so you know it's polyatomic. You check your polyatomic ion sheet, and yay and behold, ammonium turns out to be NH4 with a charge of plus one. Same thing with carbonate. Carbonate is CO3 minus two. The only way you can add up to zero here is if you have three ammoniums and one carbonate. Two ammonium ions for every one carbonate ion is the ratio. So there you go. You can't just put a 2 down by the hydrogen here because then you'd have 42 hydrogens in ammonium and you can't change the formulas of these polyatomic ions. So keep ammonium as a separate polyatomic ion. Put it in brackets. Realize you have two of them. 2 times positive 1 balances off the negative 2 for carbonate. And that is the correct formula for ammonium carbonate. Um, I think up here you'll notice that I probably have added mm -hmm, um, too many plus ones. So I'm glad you noticed that. You might want to scratch one of those out. What happens if I actually scratch that myself? I'm going to scratch that out. No, I'm not. It's gone. Anyhow, uh, right there, you should only have one of those. So let me know when you're ready to move on to the last of the assigned worksheets, the most challenging one, naming ionic compounds with multivalent ions. If you can do that puppy, you know basically everything in this chapter you need to know. And again, as with all of these, number one to 20 is for you to practice with, check with me to make sure you're doing them right, and then when you're ready to have it marked, turn in number 21 to 40. Uh, can't emphasize again, um, some of you are not turning in some of these practice sheets, getting the feedback on them. The whole point of it is to get the feedback to make sure you actually know what you're doing. So, last words. Rules are only of use if you know them, and the only way to know them is to use them over and over again. We call it practice. You've been actually given very few worksheets. I'm not actually assigning any check your understanding or review questions, although you need more practice. Do feel free in your chapter to try them. If you want answers, I'd be delighted to give them. Bottom line is you must make the choice to either master this material or not. There is a written section on both the chapter test as well as the final exam where you will have to use all of these rules. And most importantly, recognize when and when not to use them. See me for a flowchart for naming ionic compounds. So just to emphasize the importance of this section, this chapter, there are at least three quizzes in the chapter just to uh, yeah, give you some accountability and make sure that you are aiming for mastery. So that is the rule book.